Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Today we're, we're, we're literally uh, kicking off. We're kicking off. And you know, and as, as I was, uh, you know, I've been planning all of our series for the next three months. I plan it at least three months in advance. And of course, I'm always flexible. If God tells me to go a different direction, I do it. But, but how many know that, that God wants you to plan? And, and so uh, I, I'm kicking off, literally, I'm kicking off a whole new series called I Heart My Church. And, and, but I want to bring you some understanding because I think there's so many uh, interpretations out there of, of what it means to, to love your house. See, every single one of you have a physical home where you do life in. It's where you sleep. It's where you eat. It's where you do life. But there's also something that God created called the church. You know what? And, and, and it's a spiritual home. But there are so many spiritual homeless Christians in this world that don't have a place that they can call home. And there's something important about being planted in the house of the Lord. The Bible says in Psalms 92, 13, it says, those who are planted in the house of God or those who are rooted in the house of God, they will flourish. Come on, God wants us to flourish in his house. And, and I hope and pray that in the next few weeks as I, as I talk about this subject, I, I pray that you would have a new perspective about the church, that you would have a, 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 a greater idea of maybe uh, of, of something that you've created in your own head or, or maybe through an experience that you had through, through a church you've attended before. I have met so many Christians that have all kinds of stories of how they've been hurt in church. But uh, I'll be honest with you. Listen, hurt is not only in the church. Hurt is outside of this church as well. The question is, is who's, who, who do you keep your eyes on? That, that's, that's the most important thing because hurt is everywhere. You go to work, there's hurt there. Uh, you go to school, there's hurt there. You go into the supermarket, into the malls, there's hurt. You go into a football stadium like today, Super Bowl, there'll probably be like 70,000 people in that stadium. Guess what? It's, it's a field full of hurt. You come to church, any church, it's filled with hurt. But how can you, how can you love the church in the midst of hurt? And the answer is Jesus. He's the, he's the only way. And, and so... And this is a pretty cool football. This one I got blessed. This one was signed by one of the Patriots and given to me. I love it. So don't you dare touch this. <laughs> and don't start your jokes. Is it deflated? Don't, don't do that. I've already heard all those. I've heard, I've heard them all already, okay? I've heard, all day. Listen, it started at 7 a.m. I don't want to hear it. Don't, don't bring me all your little. I let the field do the talking. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. How many were here last year for our Super Bowl party last year? Remember when you're all hating on me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I say? I said, hey, the game is not over till it's over. Uh-huh. So watch it. <laughs> Everybody say, I heart my house. I heart my house. What does that mean? That means I, I love my church. And, and we have to have a sense of pride. I mean, today, all of us that are, that are sporting our, our team, there's a pride that goes be, behind the, the wearing of a jersey. And, 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 and I see Cowboys, and I've seen, you know, it's Steelers, and I've, I've seen all kinds of different jerseys of teams that, that people like to represent. But let me tell you something. The church should be no different. You represent the Lord Jesus Christ, hopefully. Hopefully there's a pride about being not only a follower of Jesus, but there's a pride uh, of the place that you call church home. I, I pray that, that we would have this, this, this commitment, this, this loyalty, this, this faithfulness, this, this zeal for the house, so that, that, that people, when they look at you, you bleed the church. The Bible says this. He says, you are an open epistle, ready to be read by all. You see, right now as a follower of Jesus Christ, if you claim to be a believer, people are reading you right now. 
They're reading what type of Christian you are. They're reading whether or not your 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 love, like the Bible says, we are to be love. Whether you're light, like the Bible says, we are to be light and salt. Right? They begin to read whether or not you're kind, whether or not you're gentle, whether or not you're truth. Because let me tell you something: there is a lot of fraud and fake Christians out there. There is. They exist. You know what? It, it's the reality. But there are a lot of fruitful, faithful, loyal, and ready to give everything for Christ cause. Uh, and, and I pray that, that we, the church, that when we say, I love my house, I love my church, we're saying the reason we love it is because this is where we come back together corporately and we begin to give God the biggest shot of praise. And then we understand that we're not the only ones that, that, that are strong believers in these last days, but that we truly believe in what we preach. We truly believe in what we live. We truly believe in what God says in his word. And no, we're not religious. Man, we have this amazing relationship that we want to shout it from the mountaintops because we want everybody to know this love that saved us and his name is Jesus. Amen. That's, that's, the, that's the jersey I want to wear. One that says, I love what God loves. And God loves the church. He loves the church. And so in these next few weeks, I want to remind us, but not only remind us, I want to reinforce what God thinks about the church. I'm not going to give you my opinion about the church, though I have plenty of them. But I want you to, to really get an understanding and a revelation of what God thinks about the church. I want us to look at the church differently because this house matters to God. Just like every single church that's in Santa Clarita, it matters to God. Every church that, that, that is in, in, the, in the states or, or globally, God cares about every single church. You know who the church is? It's you. He cares about you. He loves you. He cares about your success. He cares about your health. He cares about your peace. He cares about you having joy. He cares about you walking in the victory that you and I already got through his son, Jesus. God cares. He cares about you. Look at your neighbor and say, he cares about you. Yeah. And so today, you're going to have billions of people that are going to be hanging out. Listen, now if you go to Mexico, I've been traveling to Mexico like 15 times a year now. It's ridiculous. But they, they, they watch all the football games in America now. Just about every country watches football now. So it's no longer millions. Billions of people watch this game. And today people are coming together in houses. And they're, and they're, and they're sharing food. Everyone's bringing, you know what, a, 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 you know, a plate of something, carne asada. They're bringing hot dogs, hamburgers. You know, treat, now, how many are happy you're done with the fast? Right? Oh, yeah. Now go for your fast food. And so people are coming into homes and, and they're sitting in couches in different people's houses and they're dipping their chips. And hopefully you're not double dipping while we have all this <laughs> nasty flu going on, all right? Like tell your people don't double dip, man. There's a flu going on. All right, that's nasty. Don't do that. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to do that today. Don't do that. Don't double dip. That's nasty. But, but listen... But people are going to laugh. Uh, people are going to fellowship. People are going to come together and they're going to shout. They're going to shout every single time their team completes a touchdown. The, 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 the room is going to go wild when their team completes the touchdown. But let me tell you something. I have never seen a touchdown transform or change anyone's life. But every single week that we come together in this house, Huh? You come and you sit in this house. You come and you feed in this house. You come and you rest in this house. And when you come into this house, man, God's presence will literally fill the room and he'll fill your heart and your mind with empowerment, with joy, and even a sense of, I can do this. I can get out of this. I, can, I can't come out of this. Man, I can see a better tomorrow. Man, this is not forever. This is just temporary. I, I'm telling you, there's something about this house, there's something about the church that God wants us to experience and have a shout about. Because let me tell you something, the church changes lives. But touchdowns don't. 
I love touchdowns. But the touchdown that I love to see here every single weekend is when people that come to this place, whether they're, they're Christians who have fallen away from God like the prodigal sons and daughters, or when people walk into this place that claim to be an atheist like I was at one point, or people that are just far away from God, people that are depressed and hurting, but then they walk in this place. And you know what? Every single Sunday, we see anywhere from, from 10 to 20 plus people give their lives to Jesus. Let me tell you something. That's Super Bowl Sunday every single weekend. Every weekend that you and I bring people into this house, they receive hope. Say this with me. Say the church, the church. is the hope of this world. Yeah. Yeah, and when I say the church, I'm not talking about the four walls. I'm not talking about a building where, where we come and get. I'm talking about you. You're the church. You're the one that brings change. You're the one that brings transformation. I'm not talking about a church that we, that we say, well, I go to Elevate Church because I love their worship. Or I go to Elevate Church because, you know what, when pastor speaks or when anyone speaks up here, man, they're like, they're like reading my, my mail. Or I go to church because I love the programs they have. You know what, that shouldn't be the reason why I love my house. That really shouldn't be, though it is for many people. No, the reason that we come to a place like this and say, I love my house, is because this is the place where you meet your God. Corporately. This is the place where we see miracles, signs, and wonders take place. You see, God says, you go ahead and, 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 and you work out the plans that I have set before you, right? He says, and I will make the miracles happen. That, that's what God says to us. The church is no longer just a place where, where we meet and we call it an institution. This is not an institution. Man, this is the house of God. This is the place of worship. This is the place where you come and, and you surrender and you yield. This is the place where you come and you can say, God, as the word is going forth, it's convicting me to get right with you. This is the place where you come here and you know that you're, you may be just a little bit off. You can be one degree off from completely just forfeiting your salvation. But by the grace of God, he made a place called church where we can come together. And when you're sitting around or standing around people, other believers, believers their life becomes a conviction of your life and you want to make it right that's the church a place where people find restoration a place where people find hope a place where people find peace a place where people can find meaning for their life I, I can tell you this the church was the lifeline for my life I discovered my call I discovered the meaning of my life in the local church I discovered that God called me to pastor in the local church. Do you know that in the church, God can help you discover your divine purpose for this life? You weren't born by accident. God has something divine for you. But see, but the question is this. Do you truly believe that in his house is where God will show you the secret things, the mysteries that God wants to reveal to you? This is the place. Many of you have already discovered your call. You know what? Uh, as I've been talking to, to Mie and, uh, and Devin, uh, they were our, our media team leaders. You know what? They, they were successful business people. They had a thriving company. Uh, they, they were doing a, um, a company of, of shipping uh, stuff from the United States into different parts of the world. I mean, it was a successful company. As they were serving here, his wife was an atheist. His wife sat in this church. She's Japanese, and if you know anything about Japan, it's only 1% Christian, okay? His wife was an atheist, didn't believe in God. She sat in here for six months before she finally came to know Jesus Christ in this house. And then they sold their company years later. Why? Because they discovered that, wait a minute, yes, we're great business people, but God has called us to preach the gospel gospel to a country named Japan and they both sold everything they had their houses their cars their business they sold everything because they discovered finally the true meaning of their life and I believe that there's many people in this room right now that you don't even know that your life has greater meaning than what you're doing right now and now they're in Japan 
and they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he's always WhatsApping me, and we're emailing each other all the time, and he's telling me how God is just changing their life, and how God is taking them to a season, through a season. He's always watching live stream. If you're watching, Devin, I love you. Uh, but he's always watching live streams like, Pastor, man, God, you want, you preach about pruning? Oh, God is pruning us. And they're like, we're no longer just praying, God, give me. We're praying, God, prune us. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and see, and when you realize, when you finally come to the conviction that the place that you come to every single week, it's not a place where you just come and you sit down on your lazy boy. It's not a place where you just come and you're just being fed all the goodies, all the popcorn, all the nachos, all the pizza, all the, the steak. The cut. This is not a place. The church was not a place to sit and be comfortable for the rest of your life. There's a season where you do come and you sit and you're comforted by the Holy Spirit. But God sent his only son, Jesus, to die for you and I. And at some point, God says, okay, son, daughter, now I've called you to live a resurrected life. That means resurrect your butt off the couch. <laughs> huh? Some of us are still dead in our couch. Mad at me yet? <laughs> We're open epistles. I wonder how people read you right now. Honestly. Because, please, please don't take this wrong. How people view you is how they view your church. Why would I want to go to a church that is rude? Why would I want to go to a church that is living a double life? Why would I want to go to a church that doesn't love or forgive? You're, you're an open book ready to be read by all. What do people say about God's church? You. Grab your finger and point it at someone. Just, yeah, don't, don't worry, they won't get mad at you. Just, oh, okay, 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 now listen to me. Now listen. No, no, I didn't say stop. Point your finger at someone, please. Now, now listen, just say, I'm sorry, my bad. And then point it back at you. <laughs> Why do I tell you that? Because, because listen, because the church is so busy pointing the finger at someone else's little, you know what, stick or what do you call that little thing that gets in your hands a splinter when you got a big old log in your eye it, it what do people say about the church because of me how do people define the church because of you because what they read in you is what they read about the church and I know there's so many Christians, uh, and listen, I, I love Christians, but help us, Jesus. It takes faith to love Christians sometimes. It really does. Because you got a lot of good Christians that are talking smack about the church. They don't realize, listen, when you slander a church, you're not slandering that pastor. You're not slandering that leader. You're not slandering that. You know who you're slandering? You're slandering your God. Because the reality is this, is that God is never going to agree with you. Be the church. Be the church. All right. You ready for some scripture? All right. But first of all, we're going to do something. Can we do a little something? Some? Okay. Because today you got all kinds of people expressing what they feel about their team. For example, let me give you two uh, sentences that I want you to finish off. Look at the first sentence here. The winner of the Super Bowl is going to be? Let's try that again. I need everybody's help. Ready? <laughs> the winner of the Super Bowl is going to be? Okay. All right. Okay. All, the, all the, the spiritual people are like, Jesus, yay, yay. <laughs> Lying like a dog. <laughs> How about this one? And the loser of the Super Bowl is going to be? See, see, 
<laughs> you know, the ADM actually did this correctly, you know. You guys are like, Jesus. <laughs> know when to be spiritual and learn when to be practical, okay? No, listen, you know what? You, you, have, you have a room of confusion, right? That's the church today. There's so much to not. God said, build me a house, right, that will worship me in the nations. And what do we do? We build denominations. He says, make me a holy nation, and we make him denominations. And there's so much confusion of what is the right gospel. Open your Bible, stick to the word, and that is the gospel. That is the great commission that Jesus wants us to follow. There is no, God didn't create denominations. Man created that. God's not confused who won. Let me tell you something. God has already won your Super Bowl for your life. Why do I say that? Because you and I, though Jesus in the Bible, it says, and Satan is a defeated foe. Man, Jesus, he's confident in what he did. He's like, man, that dude, he's under my feet. He's very clear. How many of you actually believe that the enemy is under your feet? I mean, for real, like, come on, because you can't say, I heart my house, but you, but you have no faith in your house. He said he's a defeated foe. Why did he say that to you and I? Because he says, because regardless of me defeating Satan, see, I took care of the big stuff, okay, but you still have an opponent. You still have an adversary. But you have to remember that you're not fighting for victory. You're starting to fight from victory now. You're fighting from the place of Jesus. Therefore, no matter how bad it looks, you win all the time. We don't know who's going to win today, obviously. Nobody can answer that question. I mean, I can give you my guess. <laughs> but then you'd all go crazy if I said it. So I'm going to stop it right now because I want the Holy Spirit here. But, but here's the reality. Nobody knows who's going to win, but God already knows who won. And he won the victory. Jesus won the victory. Shouldn't there be pride in that? Man, when we come in here, it shouldn't be a religious thing where you come to church just to check it off the, the weekend list. Like, yep, we did church. Good, I feel better about myself now. God doesn't want you to be, feel better about yourself. God wants you to feel solid about your relationship with him. God wants you to feel like, like you have meaning in this walk with him. God wants you to feel like you have divine purpose as you walk. Even if you don't know what you were born to do yet, but still I can walk in the divine meaning that I know what it's like to live for him. Like there's meaning in our relationship. God knows I love him and, and, and I know that he loves me. Let me take you to Matthew 16. Look at this. Is it Matthew 16? Yeah. Look, Jesus said, I will Build my church. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Isn't that good news that Jesus said, I'm going to build this church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And the gates of hell will not overcome it. Listen, when, when you're going through something, you got to get the revelation of, I love my house because nothing can overcome what Jesus has built. And Jesus is all about building people up. Satan tears people down. God builds people up. Every single time you come to this place, we build you up. How do, how do we build you up? Jesus said, you know what? My mission was to go into all the world and to preach this gospel and to make believers come to a place where they trust the Father to reconcile this relationship. But then God said, he said, but then my son died on a cross to empower the church now, to empower you and me to be life changers. He empowered you and I. He empowered you. He empowered you. The apostle Paul, let me tell you something. He got the revelation. I'm praying that you're going to get a different revelation today about the church. Please listen. Don't check out yet. I'm almost done. 
But the Apostle Paul got the revelation. He got the revelation of the importance of the church. He got the revelation of when, when Jesus said, I will build my church. He understood it. Look at Ephesians right here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23 says, Christ is the head of the church. Who's the head? Christ. Who's the head? Christ. Who's the head? Christ. You know who the pastor of this church is? Jesus. He's, he's the shepherd of this house. I'm just a little tender of his house. Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Huh? Look at this. Read this again with me. Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. There's three things of order here. He says, number one, he's saying Christ is the head. He's the head. Number two, he says the church is his body. Guess what? We're his body. And you know what? And he is the savior, number three, of the church. He is the savior of the church. Here is the problem with today's culture. Listen, and I'm sure you've probably said this at some point, or you know someone who has said this to you. Why do I have to go to church to be in relationship with God? I don't need to go to church to say that I'm a Christian. Well, let me tell you something. When you think like that, what you're saying is, I want a decapitated Jesus. You want to get rid of the head. Well, let me tell you something. That's not going to work very good because the order of God is that he died for the church. He died not only for the church, but he was ready and willing to build the church. So the church is not an institution where, where I don't have to go and go in gatherings just because I'm a so-called Christian. Well, guess what? It's not about that. It's about being locked in arms. It's about being unified. It's about coming together corporately and worshiping the one. You know what happens when the church comes together? Man, the city is looking. What are they doing? Man, people start wondering. You know how many people always tell me, you know what? The reason I came to this church is because every single week I would drive by Main Street and I would see all these people happy. And I'd see all these people hugging. I'd see all the, and then you know what? I just, it kind of just stroked my curiosity. And so I just decided to come check out what the heck is going on there. And, and then I gave my life to Jesus. And then here I am. I'm in your church now. <laughs> That's the church. That's the church. But I wonder how many of you have personal stories like that where people that you work with now come to your church because they started looking at you and saying, man, there's something about you always being happy. Man, there's something about you always being integrous. Man, there's something about you always pursuing and enduring. Man, there's something about you that I just had to go check where you went. You said, yeah, come to Elevate Church. Oh, you're just biased because you're the pastor. Let me tell you something. Before I was a pastor of Elevate Church, I was someone that was an attender of a church, and I brought so many people to Jesus Christ. To this day, I may be the pastor of this church, but outside these four walls, I win people to Jesus Christ. There are people in this church because I invited them to this church. You see, I believe in my church. This is the message to check yourself got to check yourself. Man, how do I feel about my house? This is your house. If you come to this church, this is your house. How do you, how do you tend to it? How do you keep it up? How do you support it? How do you get behind it? Because we're not coming here just to hang out. We're coming here with a divine purpose to ignite every single one of you. To come to a place in your life where you finally say, wow, I know why I'm on this earth. You see, you and I, decapitating the head would be foolish. That's like trying to go on a football field like today, the Patriots and the Eagles. And one of the teams decide, I ain't wearing my helmet. Watch this video. Look, look at this. The pocket, middle of the field, incomplete. Pushing the ball, and a flag does 
Off the play fake, over the middle, and oh. and then the ball is intercepted as it was McCourty who comes up with it. That's how Christians treat the church. I don't need the church. Then you get hit. Then you're out. Then you're in a daze. You see, man, you need the head, guys. But you also need the body. Because you can say, well, I love Jesus. That's all I need. Well, guess what? Well, you can have a head, but you got no body, so you ain't going nowhere. And when Jesus talks about the church, he talks about the whole body. He talks about the head, and he talks about the toes. What do you mean toes? He says, and everywhere the, the, the sole of your feet goes, I will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He talks about, look, look, look at this verse right here. On, on, put, give me the one on helmet, please, guys, quickly. Look at this verse. He says, Ephesians 6, 17, accept God's salvation as your what? Except God's what? Salvation. He's also, so he's the head, right? Then there's the body. And then he says, and I am the savior of the body. So he says, you need to start learning how to accept the fact that this is my order. I will build my church. Why would you not want to be a, a part of something that God has divinely built for you to be a part of? It's called Team Jesus. Amen? So the next time someone tells you, well, why are you always serving? How come you always go to church? How come you're always giving to your church? Why do you always go? Why do you have to go this Sunday? Why do you have to go every Sunday? Why do you have to go to Ignite? You know why? Because that is the place where God changed my life. That's why. It's been my lifeline. It changed my children. It changed my family. Come on, that's the place I, where I came in broken, busted, and disgusted. That's the place where I went where everybody was rejecting me. My own friends were turning their back on me. But then I walked into that church, and they believed in me. They loved me. They loved me back to life. They got me resurrection life. Why would you even think to sit there and to listen to anyone? You better learn how to have a response when they come for the hit and tell you, why do you go to church? You see, I know for a fact that every single one of us have had someone tell us, well, why do you need to go to church? And we come with some lame statements. Well, because, you, know, it's, it's, you know, it's good for our family. Well, heck, if your team was playing today, man, if you ask me, well, why are the Patriots playing again? I'll tell you why. Because we're the best in the league. Well, hold, hold on, hold on, no, hold, no, sir, listen to me. But that's my conviction. Because we're solid. Because we show up to practice. Because we endure. Because all of us, we're a team. Because we all believe. No one's gossiping about no one here. No, we're in it to win it. But when people talk about your church, what's your conviction? Because when they talk about your church, they're talking about your Savior. Oh, we go because it's nice. It's uh, just good for the kids. <laughs> that Jesus went through all that on the cross for you and I to just say, oh, because it's nice. It's where I find my husband. It's where I'm going to find my wife. I've had people leave this church. You know why? They've told me, Pastor, my spouse is in here. I need to go find the right church where I can find my spouse. I'm like, wow. 
God says, I weigh the motive of your heart. The church is messed up because of us. People aren't mad at Jesus. They're mad at Christians. People don't have an issue with Jesus. They have an issue with Christians. I'll tell you why I love my church. Because there's restoration in that place. Because there's healing. I had, I had cancer. And that was the place where I had hundreds if not thousands of people praying for me. That was the place, man, when I was sick in bed. Man, I had so many people praying for me. Man, that was the place where I was lost, man. I was so lost, but then, man, Christ found me. That was the place where I was so filled with rage and anger, but then God healed me. That was the place, man, when I was filled with addiction. Man, when I was stuck on porn, stuck on this, stuck on that, stuck on drugs and alcoholic. But, man, I just kept going to that place called church. And the people just loved me back to life. And his love compelled me to change. How do you feel about your church? How would you describe it? How would you define it? Because everybody today is defining their life or their team. <laughs> and just know it. Does that look like a pretty helmet? No, but guess what? You may take hits in life, but praise God for the helmet of salvation. <laughs> praise God. I was knocked down, but not knocked out. I got back up because Jesus gives me the, the zeal and the passion to keep going strong for him. You don't get hit and then give up. You don't get hit and then quit. You don't get hit and throw your hands in the air and walk off the field. No, you get hit time after time after time but praise God for his grace praise God for his power praise God for his perseverance and the endurance that he placed in you by the Holy Spirit who helps you resurrect you back up from a dead place maybe right now you're dead in vision you're dead in dreams man you're dead in your spiritual walk with God or link up with him today because he'll resurrect your life back up at this hour at this moment you don't have to wait a day a week a month you just begin to call on the name of Jesus who's your savior and he will save his body amen, amen. we got to change the way we think and how we view the church say it with me I love my church how many love their church yeah that was a weak one but I'll take it that was weak yes amen let me finish with these these two verses, I love it. Why do I uh, bring this to you? Why do I want to talk about this subject? Because you know what, though Peter was, uh, was, a, was a great, y'all want to turn that off, please? Thank you so much. Jesus loved Peter. He loved his disciples so much, but he also came to a place where, he also came to a place where he questioned um, his heart. And Jesus, three times, he tells Peter, Peter, do you love me? And, and Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus said, um, tend my sheep. And then Jesus says it again, the second time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, Lord, I love you. He says, feed my flock. And a third time, he says to him, Peter, do you love me. And Peter was like, Lord, only you know. You know I love you. And he said, then take care of my sheep. You see, Jesus wasn't talking about lambs or sheep. He was talking about taking care of people. 
You see, you can't say you love Jesus and you don't take care of people. You can't. There's no way. But that's the church's job. Exactly. So where are you? Well, I'm not, I'm not a pastor. That's the, that's the pastor's job. Uh, no, it didn't say the pastor. It says the church. And, and, so, and so I'm bringing this message to us because we, we need to get a, a new revelation of the church, of Jesus. And, and you can't say, you know, I love you, but you're not helping anybody. That, that is false. God measures, listen, he measures his love by how you love people. That's how he measures it. Why? Because God is love. And if you're his son or his daughter, then guess what? Love should be literally just pouring out of you for people that are far away. Let me show you this video testimony. Watch this. This is love. Hi, my name is Rochelle Rodriguez. Family, uh, church for about five years. I have a son named Jaden Roelio Rodriguez, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about his story. Um, he was born in 2014. We started seeing changes around two years old. Uh, he was developing as, as quickly as other children his age. Uh, so we took him to the doctor. They recommended speech therapy, developmental therapy. Um, they also did mommy and me classes, which he, all, he hated. He used to cry. Um, nothing helped. So by the age of three, um, they diagnosed him with autism. And that was August the, the 4th, 2017. That day I left, you know, the, the psychologist's office crying. Um, but I knew there was healing room and I that night here at church and I was like I have to get there so I brought him um Steve Driller also met me in front but I know when I walked into the sanctuary I know God told me I was waiting for you and I was like okay but I was still crying you know uncontrollably um Steve Driller also said that God had told them to pray to pray over Jaden that he would loosen his tongue so they did you know he started being calmer I would see you know a little you know just a little bit more of a, a sounds um, from him, but nothing too drastic. And um, so I started searching God. And I was like, you know what? I'm like, there has to be something. If if the doctors are telling me no, you, there has to be a yes somewhere. And it has to be in the spiritual. Came upon um, Mark 9, 17 through 29, where Jesus heals um, the little boy, but the disciples weren't able to because they hadn't prayed and fast. Um, so I was like, okay. So I took that, and then um, as I was searching through the internet, I found a specialist in Spain who had a six-month wait. Um, we were actually seen in two months, so that was confirmation that I was getting closer. When I spoke to the specialist, she said she would email me, you know, Jaden's new diet, his supplements, and everything we were going to do for him. Um, she expected him full, to be in full remission in 12 months, but he would have to be on a special diet for the rest of his life. So when she emailed me, she told me, I guess she noticed something, or God told her. Um, she told me to pray and to forgive myself because all these years I had thought I had done something wrong as a mom and that's why Jaden wasn't developing as he should and it, it, it wasn't just guilt it was embarrassment because as a mom you feel like you didn't do enough and he gave me Mark 7 37 confirmation then he told me He's like, when I heal Jaden, he will no longer be on that diet. And that was confirmation also because I know he was involved in getting me to be seen by the specialist before six months. He told me in my dream, dedicate Jaden. So I'm here to dedicate Jaden today because I'm being obedient. But as I'm being obedient, I'm seeing God work just in steps. You, you might think that they're the smallest little steps, but I look at them because I'm seeing my son being able to just to interact more with me. Really wanted to thank the church. I wanted to thank you guys for praying. Frank, Pastor Mauricio, um, all the team that has been praying. I have no idea who's been praying. I don't know what you guys are praying, but I haven't slept in four years. And since you guys have started praying since Sunday, me and my son have slept. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Listen. When she came to the end of herself, she realized nobody can help me. But then she realized, but the church. The church is the hope of this world. And today at the 12 o'clock, we have baby dedication. She's dedicating Jaden today to Jesus. Listen, everyone is looking for meaning. The church brings meaning 
to life. It does. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.